Good afternoon. Uh, we are now streaming live. Uh, welcome to the Vermont House Judiciary Committee, and it is Wednesday, February 10th. And um, this afternoon, we're going to uh, deviate a little bit from our agenda. Uh, the first item on the agenda says that Representative Rachelson will be discussing the budget um, issues. However, she is in appropriations right now, um, listening to testimonies. So, uh, so we'll postpone her uh, presentation uh, for now. And I, um, I think that uh, Representative Gosselin is with her as well, because I don't see him here. So with that, Eric, if we could turn to you on H87. I didn't know if you, did you have a question or anything first. I'm still not seeing the documents posted. So maybe uh, something's wrong on my end. It, it, let me double check with Evan and Mike on that, but okay. I'm not. Posting right now, Eric. Thank you. And Martin, do you want to take the lead on this since this is a your, your bill and you, you know it so well. Sure, yeah. Um, so we walked through this uh, last week. Eric wasn't available. I did the best I could, Eric. I tried to channel your uh, insight into bills. And, uh, Very kind. So I'm sure it was great. Any, any confusion about the bill, uh, that's why you're actually here to straighten it all out. Uh, <laughs> we have confused everything. No, I'm just kidding. So mm -hmm. one of the big issues, uh, we, we just wanted to to take this opportunity to actually go through, you know, it's, it's a long bill and, and it's actually relatively redundant relative to what it does as far as changing uh, the way the penalties are, but really wanted to walk through each offense. Some of them are fairly straightforward, but some of them might need just a little more explanation for folks to kind of understand what the offense is and then just tell us kind of uh, what the penalty or what we're changing uh, with respect to the offense. I think that will kind of ground us a little bit better in, in this aspect of our criminal code, the uh, property crime. So really appreciate that. And I'll turn it over to Eric. Sure. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Again, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to talk uh, to the committee about H87. Um, as Representative Lalonde was saying, there's quite a number of uh, property offenses involved in that portion of the bill. I, it sounds like you've already heard, you know, that the big picture that the bill creates a classification system for for the Vermont uh, criminal code for all the offense criminal offenses in Vermont sets up uh, classes of offense for example a b c d and e felonies a through e misdemeanors as well many other states do it that way Vermont has has uh, not enacted such a system uh, up to date and that's the proposal in in h87 and uh, the piece I think we're talking about today just if you think about there's different categories, different types of offenses. Property offenses is the topic for today. And the, the general approach of H87 uh, is to not 100% of the time, but I would say probably 80 to 90% of the time, it uh, fits property offenses into the scheme of, of categorization according to the value of the property involved in the offense. So, uh, and there are some, plenty of property offenses on the books actually, for example, by that I mean, say uh, retail theft, just picking one off the top of my head. Uh, an offense like retail theft has been in the past, uh, a misdemeanor or a felony based on the amount of money or property that was stolen, the value of the property stolen. So uh, you'll notice in a lot of offenses, it's a strange number. But uh, uh, the demarcation line between a misdemeanor and a felony under current law is frequently $900. Uh, sort of an odd figure, one might think, but it's a product, as many things are, of legislative compromise. Years ago, there was a summer study committee that looked at that exact issue and uh, was trying to figure out, I think the old number had been $500, and uh, many people thought that that was, uh, uh, you know, at times had passed, inflation, that sort of thing. $500 was too low of a number to distinguish between felonies and property offenses, uh, sorry, felonies and misdemeanors. Uh, but some people didn't, some people wanted to go to 750 and other people wanted to go to 1,000. So they landed on 900. So that's the, in many places in existing laws, 
if you go through it today, you'll even see this $900 difference between felonies and misdemeanors. Um, so the, the concept of distinguishing between, you know, the grade of the offense on the basis of the amount of the value of the property involved is not new. That's, that's in law already. But the proposed uh, scheme that H87 uses is more detailed in it. And um, we'll look at it specifically just now. I just kind of want to give that as background. That's sort of most of the offenses, not all of them, but most of them take that approach. And so in that sense, uh, you know, I think going through the offenses themselves, the substance of it may take a little more time. But once you get used to what these categories are, I think we can move pretty quickly through that um, and compare what the what penalty the offenses have now with what the proposal of H87 is going forward to be the new penalty. Um, so having said that, I prepared a couple of documents that I hope will be helpful for moving us along. And thank you, Mike and Evan, for posting. Them. I'm going to try and uh, turn to them right now, see if I can pull them both up. Uh, so am I, I'm, so I'm trying to share the document and it says only the host can share in this meeting. I might, I might need to be made the co-host, Mike or Evan. All righty, thank you. All right. Let's see here. I think we're moving along okay. All right. Okay, is everyone seeing these documents now? I'll assume that's a yes. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Thumbs up, but nobody uh, responded by unmuting. All right, thanks. Um, so I've got two documents, and I'm probably going to try and toggle back and forth between them as we go along here. So just to show you what they are. First of all, I took the bill itself. Uh, you'll see there's a highlighted, so we can tell that this is not the bill as introduced at the top there. This is a property crimes penalties uh, rework of the bill, really just highlighting and adding in language where it would be helpful. Uh, this and this piece of it is just to sort of explain to everybody what the substance of each of these property offenses are. So I'm going to zip right down to where it's through the first introductory parts and get to the offenses themselves. And the first one, I believe, yes, is fraudulent use of a credit card. So uh, this is going to be one document. The other one I'll now show you is, um, oops, this chart. Now this, I, I, I reworked in uh, um, the, a chart that the Sentencing Commission had produced, and, and thanks to James Pepper for getting me a Word version of this that I could, that I could modify a little bit. Um, so what I'm trying to show here, if you see, we just look at the offense of the credit, fraudulent use of a credit card offense, for example. We haven't looked at it in detail, but that's what we were looking at was the first one. So on the chart, you'll see with respect to that same offense, the first one, credit card fraud, $50 or less, and actually the next one down is $50 or more, same thing, credit card fraud. Uh, the next row over is just the statute where it is, it's just the citation to the statute we were just looking at. And the next row, you'll see penalty, that's the current penalty. So that's what the penalty is now for that offense, fraudulent use of a credit card. Uh, right now, it's uh, as you see, it, it depends on the amount, uh, the value of the, of the fraud, the value of a uh, fraudulent property obtained, you can see the $50 is the threshold. Um, if it's $50 or less, it's the current penalty is a misdemeanor, six months in prison, $500 fine. Whereas if the, uh, the amount involved is $50 uh, or, or should say more than $50, uh, it's a one year misdemeanor with a $1,000 uh, fine. Everybody sort of following along so far, we're moving left to right on the chart. So then uh, skip to the next, skip the next call, but go to the next one. And that's the proposal. That's the proposed penalty. So they, you'll be able to see by looking at these two columns, what the current penalty for the offense is and what the proposed penalty is. And you'll see in the, uh, in the proposed column, the first that I've listed uh, what the tier system is. Now I'm not, 
not going to list this every time because it would take a lot of space. And I think I just, but I listed it once for each page so that, because it's hard to memorize it, but that way we'll be able to sort of as we're going through each page, see, oh yeah, what's that? What's the value amount that distinguishes between each of the tiers? And you'll see, so if you follow down, I'm on the, you know, that second to last column over what the, the, the tiered proposal, um, and let's walk through that for a second and remind ourselves what that proposal is. So if the offense involves, remember it all turns on the value of the property involved in the crime. If the value is less than hundred dollars, you see, then it's a class D misdemeanor, which has a maximum uh, incarceration period of 30 days. So 30 days imprisonment if it's a class D misdemeanor. And that's what applies if it's less than hundred dollars. If it's hundred dollars to $199, then it's a class C misdemeanor which is six months in prison. If it's a thousand to two thousand nine hundred ninety-nine, and that's essentially less than three thousand, is where we're going there. Between one thousand and three thousand, it's a class A misdemeanor, which is a two-year uh, penalty. If it involves three thousand to, and that should be that's a typo. That should be ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine because it's up to hundred thousand dollars. So if it's between three thousand and a hundred grand, then it actually becomes a felony. So that's the threshold. And getting over to a felony, that be, that's a class E felony, three years. And then lastly, if it's $100,000 or more, then it's a class D felony, five years. So that's Eric, the proposal. Eric, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't know uh, uh, last time you had something up on the screen, you said you couldn't see our hands. So, um, and yeah, I, I don't know thing. if that's so, still the same yes, thing. Okay, good. Please interrupt. Yep. Um, too late. I already did. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, uh, and I and I'm pretty sure I know the answer on the uh, um, on the terms of the uh, incarceration. Th those are like the 30 days, six months. That's up to right. That that's not a uh, a minimum. Exactly. That's the maximum. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification, Representative. I should have mentioned that 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 is a maximum. It's not required, and it's not a minimum. So uh, could be less, could even be fully suspended. You know, it could be a completely suspended suspended sense, depending on the you know particulars of the individual case. Sure, um, but that's oh. the max. And so you think about it. Okay, so that's the tier. Then the, and the proposal uh, for this credit card fraud offense. You'll see the proposal is that it follows this the tiered system. So the the sentencing commission and H eighty seven have proposed that for that offense the the penalty follow the uh, the tiers that are set up in the bill. Now, I'm just going to, for a second, contrast that so you know what I mean by that. Because not every offense do they propose. As I said, like I think I don't know, 80 to 90 percent of them or something went on this um, classification system, whereby it, it the penalty depends on the amount of property involved. But not every one of them does. So I'm just going to skip down here real quick. For example, just the first one I came to. The credit card, uh, the uh, use of a credit card skimmer, which we'll get to in a minute. That's the second one on the page I'm looking at. You see that doesn't. If you, if you walk over to, or go over to the second uh, to the last column, you'll see that one does not propose to follow the, the tiered system. It's that one proposes a specific penalty, uh, class C felony of 10 years. So that's the difference between whether you're following the tiered proposal or not. If the if the if the proposal is to follow the tiers, then the penalty varies on the basis of the amount of property involved. If not, then it will. the proposal will propose a specific penalty. And uh, for each offense, you know, a C felony, D felony, whatever it may be. And in that case, obviously, uh, the proposal was not to follow the tiered system, but to impose a specific enumerated penalty. So that's the distinction between the two types of uh, uh, penalty provisions that we're going to see as we walk through the bill and then one more, one more questionnaire yeah and, and I'm, I'm at the top at the first uh tiered um so uh fo follow tiered proposals less than a hundred dollars that's that's if the crime is less than a hundred dollars right yes exactly yeah so um, like if you use a credit card for but i but i use the credit card fraudulently on a on a 50 dollar bill say right yeah uh I guess I'm more thinking out loud because uh, uh, I'm thinking of the penalties, which of course aren't aren't listed in here. But um, that that's a 
another question for another time, I guess, if we start talking about penalties, other than just saying, you know, the class. Right. You mean like uh, what the fine might be or something? Yeah, the, yeah, the fine and, and uh, that type of thing. But I guess what's going through my mind, Alaska now, what's going through my mind is, and I'm going to assume restitution is uh, probably in the penalty somewhere. Uh, restitution is is not in each specific statute, but the but the the general approach to restitution is that restitute the court orders restitution when there's been a loss. Yes, that's that is part of the the uh, the sentence and the and the final order when there's been a financial loss and it fits the definition of victim and um, in the restitution statute, then uh, the court, I think, the, I think pretty sure the language says the court shall order restitution when there's been a, a qualifying loss, but that's okay. separate. That's separate from the fine. That's restitution. Right. That the person is supposed to pay back to, you know, whoever it is that they, that they took the money from. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I understood that, but sorry for getting off on a, on a side road. <laughs> no, it's all related. Um, so, yeah. So, so, uh, since the proposal here is to use the tiered system for credit card fraud of $50 or less or $50 or more of the first two offenses. So that's the proposal for the way this would work. And it all depends on how much uh, property you've obtained fraudulently with the credit card, uh, how much or what, what uh, the penalty for the offense would be. So uh, if you compare that, for example, let's go to the $50 or less. Um, you'll see under current law, let's go to the very top one now, current law, if you use your credit card to obtain $40 in property fraudulently, fake the credit card, that's gonna be a six month $500 fine. Uh, under the proposal, you'll see that penalty goes down because that's less than $100, right? And that, so that would make it a class D misdemeanor, the very top listed offense in, in the second to last column. And that's a 30 day penalty. So uh, that in that instance, the, the penalty would be reduced based on what it is in current law. So again, you'll see some get reduced, some get increased, some stay the same, but that, uh, you know, we'll try and hit those as we go through them. But it, it is gonna vary based on um, the amount of property that's involved. So for example, since there's only two tiers in existing law for credit card fraud, it's either under $50 or over $50, there's gonna be more variation in the, uh, in the current in the proposed penalty scheme, depending on how much money was involved. So let's say there was, oh, to pick another number, uh, five hundred dollars involved. Well, under the uh, under the current law, all right, credit card fraud, five hundred dollars. You would go down to the second one down right because that's more than fifty. So three columns over, that's going to be a one year misdemeanor, right? Under current law, but under the proposal, you go back to Oh, that's so. That's uh, category number two down from the top. That's between one hundred dollars and nine hundred ninety nine dollars. That five hundred bucks we talked about. So that's a six month misdemeanor, Class C. So in that instance, the uh, the penalty goes down. Everybody see that? Goes down from one year to six months. But on the other hand, let's say that it was uh, fifteen hundred dollars credit card used to obtain $1,500 of merchandise illegally, um, persons charged with credit card fraud. Since under existing law, there's only two categories, either below 50 bucks or above 50 bucks. Um, the 1,500 bucks doesn't change the penalty from what it was for 500. It's still one year, $1,000. But it does change the penalty under the proposal because we go, go up to those categories. All right, that brings you down to the third, the third level. That's between $1,000 and, and $3,000, basically. That makes it a, a class a, a misdemeanor, and that's a two-year penalty, which is greater than the one years. And again, you got two more categories to do. If you were using it to, for $20,000 in fraud, that bumps you up to three years. If you used it to obtain more than $100,000 in penalty, or, sorry, in property fraudulently, then it brings you up to a class, a, a class D felony, which is five years. So again, in some situations, the penalty is less. In some situations, it's more. It all depends on the amount of property involved. And when I say less, less and more, I mean as compared to the current penalties. So 
and take a moment here because I was figuring that the very the very first offense that we went through, we go through this in much more detail. I think as we go forward, we'll be able to we'll be able to move much more quickly because now everybody understands how this tiered system works. Um, but I do want to pause since this is sort of our most detailed discussion of how that system works compared to what some current penalty structures are and see if anybody's got any questions at this point. Does that make sense to folks? So I take it this is done like this because of past practice or what's going on, what, what's happened with this whole thing. I mean, kind of like the sentencing or something like that, there was such a wide range or, or no? I think uh, I'll just defer to Representative Lalonde on, on further explanation, but I think you're right that from what, that looking for some uniformity and consistency of, of penalties for offenses, I think is a, is a big factor in, in why this is uh, being proposed exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that we heard from uh, some of the witnesses who explained that consistency was an important element of why we're doing this. And particularly this particular uh, offense, uh, the same essential behavior can be you know, under current law, before, you know, um, if this bill isn't passed, you know, uh, the same uh, behavior can be charged uh, under, I believe it's uh, fraudulent use, if I'm remembering right, uh, which is a 10 year felony, or it could be charged as a credit card fraud, which you, know, you see as a six month or one year misdemeanor. And so they wanted consistency of, of behavior having consistent uh, outcomes or consistent penalties. Uh, and this is one of the prime examples where they're trying to, to have that consistency. At least that's, you know, as I understand from the prosecutors and uh, uh, particularly uh, testified to that. And this only follows, and this is probably doesn't sound very smart in me, but this only is for a Vermont resident. This isn't for somebody that does something outside of Vermont on our credit card, right? Well, it, it can, it, it would be, well, that's, that's getting into what exactly the, uh, the, offenses elements are as opposed to you know the penalty that's kind of divorced from the penalty but this is not necessarily just Vermont residents it's it's if the offense occurs in Vermont but I will let uh, Eric uh, explain that part a little bit more no that's exactly right the it, it could be the offense itself has to take place in Vermont but it could be it, it could be a resident of another state who was in Vermont and you know committed credit card offense at a fraud at a Vermont hotel. It doesn't matter if the, if the hotel was in Vermont and it took place here. It doesn't matter if the person who committed the offense was a Vermont resident or someone from out of state. But the offense does have to be committed here, yes. So the offense, so like if I called and I ordered something, um, uh, we'll just use on uh, Amazon. If, if that call was made here and it could be proven, that's when it falls into this. But if they were over... If it happened in Massachusetts, uh, if it happened, let's say in New Hampshire, it wouldn't it wouldn't be prosecuted here, correct? Even though I'm a Vermont resident. That's right. If the crime occurred in New Hampshire, that's correct. So that phone call is going to be hard to track, correct? Well, that the that's a pretty subtle question of where what courts have jurisdiction. If you're talking about a situation where, you know, perhaps one of the parties to the phone call was in Vermont, uh, but the sale didn't take place here. I, I think that's a very fact specific question. I couldn't, I couldn't answer that, you know, generally speaking, or, or, or that in every case there would be jurisdiction over the, the offense or not. Uh, it, but it is that you raise a, a point that is, you know, often, often, litigated in court and then in some of those, you know, gray area situations where it's unclear where an offense took place, which obviously these days, given our online world, uh, happens more often than it used to, um, then that can be that can be the subject of of uh, disagreement between prosecutors and defendants. But that's not something that's changed at all by this bill. That sort of 
state of the state of affairs continues as it is. Yeah, gotcha. Thanks, Eric. Right. Sure. So Will I, then uh, Bob have yeah. questions as well. All right, thank you. Wasn't sure if you were there, uh, Chair. <laughs> so I, I have a question, and I guess it's in regards to consistency. So, I mean, with I see the credit card uh, fraud and the tiers. Now, for uh, where this bill proposes a new crime uh, for a retail theft, where someone who is committing retail theft over a number of occasions uh, could law enforcement um, could, when coming up with charges, combine the totals uh, of that retail theft. Is that something that could also be applied to credit card fraud? Uh, I suppose it's, I think that's a separate offense that's created in the bill that yes. doesn't, it doesn't exist under current law. Um, that's the one place in the bill that this, that this new offense, you know, other, other than, other than that, the bill just sort of reclassifies existing offenses. But in that one case, as you point out, there's a new offense created. And uh, I don't think it applies. I suppose if it were, if it were organized retail theft in which the, and over the multiple occasions, uh, the person used a credit card to commit the theft, that's possible. But I, I, without the language right in front of me, I thought it was retail theft uh, in more of a shoplifting sense, taking goods out of a, out of a retail establishment, but we can look at that when we get to the language. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, I suspect the way it is now um, that it would be, it is just covering, uh, say, shoplifting. But right. I do wonder if we, if we are going to accept that provision and, and make that new law. I do wonder if it might make sense. I'm envisioning a scenario where someone is able to get multiple credit card numbers, so maybe commits credit card fraud with five different cards, where the penalty would be much higher if those amounts could be totaled. Thank you. Yeah. So that that might actually be a question for the prosecutors on, on how they prove that if they if they're able to if they have to look at every transaction separately unless the language is clear, which I know that we're going to be getting to in a minute. But uh, the language is not clear. It'd be interesting to find out from uh, prosecutors if if it's on a per transaction basis or if it's just the use of a credit card for however many transactions that credit card was used for. Thank or you. as Will is saying, multiple credit cards by the same person. Uh, and I don't know if, uh, Eric, if you have an answer for that or if that's something we should hold for uh, Pepper when we get him back in. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that one off the top of my head. I think, I think that in general, um, and, I, and I think Pepper or, or uh, Matt or someone else will be able to chat in more detail about this, but it 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 turns on whether the multiple use if there's nothing specifically said about it, which and I, as you see, I pulled up the, the fraudulent use of a credit card statute just now as we were talking about this to see if the language said anything. And um, I don't see anything in there specifically about multiple uses under the current statute. Um, so I think in those situations, it depends on whether the multiple instances are kind of arising out of the same sort of common set of facts, the same, the same uh, course of conduct, but, but, and the same event, really, um, if it's multiple, but if they're distinct somehow, then they might be able to charge them separately. Um, but that's a sort of a bigger picture question that the, I think the practitioners would be able to provide some, some insight about. Thank you. Um, Bob has his hand up. I just wasn't sure if you could see that. Yes. No, thanks, Sue. Okay. Uh, quick question, Eric. You, you had mentioned that, uh, not necessarily following this, this to your proposal, but uh, the court could, I guess we're going to have someone come in and explain restitution to me. I know, I know the, the basics of it are, but a court could uh, order restitution along with a, a fine uh, from the court itself to an individual. Is that correct? Yes. So historically speaking, if you know, would the court want or ask the the uh, the accused to uh, clearly pay back restitution prior to the court uh, receiving any monies, the victim, in other words. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure the priority of payment. That's a good question for uh, for again for the practitioners, um, possibly Judge Grierson. But yeah, I, I know they're separate and distinct. The the fee, uh, sorry, the fine to the court. And, and also as well as any any associated 
um, assessments are separate from the restitution order. The restitution order is separate and, and is enforceable uh, by the restitution unit in the Center for Crime Victim Services separately from uh, the court fine. But, but it's a good point about which one, I don't know if there's a prioritization or if they both sort of seek payment uh, simultaneously, I'm not certain. Yeah, okay, I guess I would lean toward the victim myself, but I guess we'll have to, hopefully Judge Gerson can answer that. Yeah, and also when when uh, Chris Fenno does um, becomes available, she can help us with that for sure in terms of uh, understanding how restitution works. Great, thank so, you. Um, so Kate has her hand up. Thank you. Um, I was just noticing, looking at the fines that are associated with these crimes and and I've seen a couple examples where the fines remain either remain the same or would, would increase under these changes. Um, just using the example of the credit card fraud, $50 or less, the time served potentially is much lower, but the fine is the same. Um, and then looking at a couple others where the fine would increase, I'm looking randomly at like false pretenses of $900 or more like theoretically, if it was $900, it would be a class C misdemeanor, which would be a $2,500 fine, which is actually higher than what the fine currently is. I'm just curious to hear a little bit about, um, about how fines were considered in this. And, and if this is maybe a better question for someone else in future testimony, um, feel free to let me know, but curious to hear a little more about that. Yeah, that's uh, uh, certainly true, and uh, that sometimes the fines are higher under the proposal as they are in current law. But as to the the why that is, I think I, I would defer to Representative Lalonde or or other representatives of the Sentencing Commission as to why they they chose that in their proposal. Yeah, I think that's another question we should probably hold for. Uh, for Pepper and uh, for Judge Grierson probably as well. Um, I don't want to do too much testifying, uh, even though I was on the Sentencing Commission. Uh, I think it probably makes more sense for for those members to weigh in on that and and answer that question. I mean, I you know I have information. I heard thing. You know, I've I kind of know what they're going to answer, but better better for it to come from them. Thank you. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Eric, uh, earlier, uh, Ken had brought it up, uh, kind of people working across state lines. If, if somebody ordered something from or, or did some kind of credit card fraud in another state uh, uh, in Vermont, uh, does that become a federal crime since it's, somebody's working across state lines? That's a possibility. Yep. The interstate interstate. Uh conduct can sometimes uh, uh, bring an offense under federal jurisdiction, absolutely. Right. Now, it doesn't yeah, mean I, they I, have I'm, to charge it, but, but they potentially right. could. Yeah, I'm sure they're not going to uh, go after somebody for $1,000, um, right. you know, but right. uh, you get up into, the, into a million or something, they, they would probably um, go for it. But thank you. Yeah. Um, I just that reminded me to pull up there, there's a not in this bill, but there's a, a general provision in the in the sort of general provisions of the criminal code about referring to crimes committed partly outside the state that's 13 VSA section two. It does say if you if you would the if a person with the intent to commit a crime doesn't act within this state, uh, which culminates in the commission of a crime either within the state or out of the state shall be punished for the such for the crime in this state as if the same as if the crime had been, had been committed entirely here then it goes on to say a crime committed by means of an electronic communication including a telephone telephonic communication shall be considered to have been committed at either the place where the communication originated or the place where it was received so if you make the call from vermont even if you're ordering something in new hampshire sounds like the statute is providing the Vermont courts with jurisdiction. Is that helpful? Do people hear that? Yeah, also, Eric, if, it, if, if the call starts in New Hampshire, 
and is called to Vermont, it can be charged here. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, so, any other questions on if, on the? I know we're sort of all at kind of the initial stage, kind of grounding ourselves in the nature of the the walkthrough. But also, we only have for, like thirty more crimes to go, right? So, you know, it's not going to take long. <laughs> <laughs> I think thirty more will get us about halfway there. <laughs> but I think they'll go a lot quicker once we're just sort of kind of framing how this this is going to work. So. Um, but it sounds like, and the other thought I had too is that so looking at the chart, um, as I as we were just as we noticed, you know, um, the uh, the substance and the elements of the offense offense are highlighted on this separate document from the chart. But my thought had been not necessarily to go look at the the elements of every offense because some of these are pretty self explanatory. So I will go through the chart. And we'll cut like for now we proceed to the next one which is forgery i think everyone understands what forgery is um i wouldn't tend to look back at the offense of to switch documents on that one um i'll only probably switch back when it seems like it's a little unclear or needs a little further explanation but if someone wants to hear more um, or if anyone feels like we should look at the offense each time please let me know uh, but for some of the ones that don't that seem relatively self-explanatory I was not um, going to switch back and look at the, the actual language of the offense, but certainly can if anybody wants to. So um, remembering that I can't see anybody raise their hand, please please just interrupt me if you want to slow down or look back at, at one of the uh, one of the offense offenses. So moving along, uh, having said that, forgery. Again, as I mentioned, I only print the tiered proposal one time on each page, but for forgery, you'll see what's the current, the current penalty for forgery is a 10 year felony, uh, pretty substantial. It does not vary at all based on the amount of uh, property that's obtained via the forgery. It's 10 years no matter what. The proposal uh, you see is to follow the tiered provision. So that means that it will depend on the amount of property involved in the forgery. And if it's, again, if it's a very small amount, $50, it's a class C misdemeanor 30 days. If it's a large amount, over $100,000, um, class D felony, five years. So it can range anywhere from five months, sorry, 30 days to five years, depending on the amount of property involved compared to the 10 year felony currently. So having said that, it must, so then I would move on to the next one, uttering a forgery. There's one that I must, I was surprised myself. I was. So what does uttering mean in the sense of a forgery statute? It's interesting. It is synonymous with publishing. So the uh, you see that in line 17, I looked that one up. And it's a, another thing I should mention, you'll see with these property offenses, many of these statutes are quite old and they use archaic language. Um, they seem to address uh, criminal acts that uh, seem like they date from quite some time ago and are not as common at, anymore. And that's just the nature of, of uh, the statutes in general and certainly the criminal code as well. That you'll see some of, the, some of the offenses covered and the language itself has been on the books for quite some time. And this uttering a forged document is, a, is an older term and it means publishing. So you see the offense here is not the actual forgery itself, right? This offense is publishing a forged or counterfeited document. So if you publish it as true, um, uh, any, uh, and you know that it's false, you know that it's forged or it's illegal, um, with the intent to injure or defraud a person, that's mine 20 or 21. So obviously a very specific offense here. <laughs> um, that's where the penalty provision of uttering a forged or counterfeited instrument um, comes in. And so we look at, well, what is the penalty for that? It is the same as the forgery itself, right? See, that's the connection between those two. If you forge the document, you get the 10 year felony, or if you utter the forged document, in other words, you publish it knowing that it was forged with the intent to injure somebody. So, um, so if I could just ask real quick, so that would be like uh, trying to sell a, a piece of artwork as, as an original or something like that. Is that what that would cover this, this crime? 
Yes, or potentially, uh, you know, a, and again, as you mentioned earlier, Representative Lawn, it seems like there's a lot of conduct that, that could be charged under many different of these offenses. But even, for example, uh, you know, um, publishing some, some fake, uh, you know, bill of sale that uh, alleges that something had been sold when it wasn't. You give it to somebody else and say, oh, yeah, this, this, I bought this piece of furniture or whatever it was, and therefore it belongs to me. Um, again, an older statute, uh, so some, sometimes hard to envision the particulars of what's going to be charged, but I think you're right that, that you know, uh, a piece of counterfeit art or, or a false document of some sort that you publicize to another person would bring that one in. You don't have to be the person who, who committed the forgery, in other words. So this next one, counterfeiting, is also interesting, I thought, particularly interesting about counterfeiting, uh, is that it's got a 14-year criminal penalty. I don't know where that came from. Uh, again, probably a product of some legislative compromise at some point in time, um, but highly unusual. Usually multiples of five is what you see in uh, criminal penalties, you know, five years, 10 years, 15, 14, very unusual, but that's what the current um, statute is. And this specifically involves counterfeiting money, counterfeiting. So you put, you know, you're, uh, you're making fake money basically is what the counterfeiting statute does. And that's what has the 14 year penalty currently. And now in the proposal, it's going to, it follows the tiered proposal. So it depends on the, uh, you know, the amount of fake money that you've made. So if it's a if it's a very small amount, it could be again going back to our tiers. I'm oh, sorry, I it's on that page a little bit lower. You'll see, uh, could be 30 days if you've only only counterfeited two twenty dollar bills, but it could be five years if it's uh, you know much more. Uh, so the you'll see is that the credit card skimmer is the first one that we've come to that actually has the exact same penalty, both in existing law and the proposal by the commission. You see that it's a 10-year felony currently, and the proposal in H87 is also for a 10-year felony. Oops, sorry. Um, and I don't know if well, everyone well, knows, but... Can, can I sorry. just... I'm sorry, uh, Eric. Uh, on the counterfeiting, if you go back to counterfeiting... Uh, yeah, I don't know how I ended up way up here. <laughs> uh, you mean to the Offense or to the penalty? Yeah, the offense is, is or either or. It's just okay. a question about counterfeiting. So, as far and, and this probably is not a question for you, but I just want to just throw it out there, and and maybe we'll get uh, some other folks to testify on it. So, if we're talking about property value, it would seem that with respect to counterfeiting, uh, that if you use the hundred dollar bill or you use five hundred dollars worth of counterfeiting and so that puts you in a certain category that's one thing uh but if you actually have ten thousand dollars worth of counterfeited bills back home but you've you've only used twenty dollars let's say you've only used gone to a store and you've been passing a counterfeit money um so it's not so I, i'm th that's a little problematic to me as far as how one would would calculate the value. So the, the other point, and, and it's something to ponder, we can again uh, get some more testimony, uh, is, you know, well, and I guess it's related. If the idea is that it really doesn't matter how you use that counterfeit currency, it's just the fact that you have counterfeited the money, uh, that that leads to the penalty then you know maybe it's somewhat divorced by what the actual value is. So I'm kind of questioning that one. I hadn't really thought of it until just now. So that's probably not a question for you unless you want to weigh in on that. But it's pro but the other the other question though I have is is there is there a federal why do we have a state law regarding counterfeiting money when it's really a, a federal offense? I mean we don't have state currency, do we? That we should be worried about shouldn't this I mean when would this I guess it probably has been used and we can ask uh, 
Robin Joy or look at some of her documents on whether it's been used. But but is there? A, I assume there's a counterpart federal law, and I guess there's a yes. There. Why do we have a state law for this as well in this particular instance? Yeah, I don't know. It's been on the books for a long time. Um, but yes, it's cer certainly true that there's a federal counterfeiting uh, criminal statute as well. Uh, yeah. It's not uh, unusual for there to be both federal and state criminal prohibitions on the same conduct. That's that's not uncommon, but it is true that it seems a bit unusual in this situation because uh, Vermont doesn't uh, print off paper money as far as I know. <laughs> but it could be, I'm just speculating, but you know, it could be that if you know someone only counterfeited, you know, forty dollars. Seems not being a counterfeiter myself, I'm not really sure, but it seems like if you were gonna counterfeit money, why would you only do two twenties? But hey, uh, if someone only did that. <laughs> then maybe that's not the kind of case that the feds would take. I don't know, I'm just speculating, but. Um. Yeah, and, and I guess the thing again is the other point is that, yeah, if you've counterfeit $10,000, but it's just in your basement doing nothing, you know, what what is necessarily the harm? The harm isn't presumably until it actually is put into commerce. But this could be a, a theoretical or discussion to have with uh, some of the other people uh, when we get them back. Okay. Eric, this this is this is punishable uh, counterfeiting by uh, federal court, not state court, right? Uh, both, it, 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 either one, yeah. Because you've got, you know, it, it's the uh, you, this offense on the books right here makes it a Vermont crime that could be punishable by a state prosecutor in Vermont, uh, but th th there's a. You know, I don't have the exact language in front of me, but there is a separate federal offense of counterfeiting as well, so that it also uh, uh, could be prosecuted by a United States attorney in, in federal court. But the state doesn't print the money the feds do. Correct. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I think that's kind of what Representative Lalonde was saying, too. I, I don't know. It, because it's such an old statute, you know, was there may have been trying to address something that happened long, long, long ago when Vermont was more in the, potentially there could be notes or something that was, were published in the, in the state. I'm not really sure. Um, you know, okay. the, the, la the language certainly says, if you look at lines 10 and 11, it, uh, you know, a, anything purporting to be a bank bill or promissory note issued by a banking company incorporated by Congress or by the legislature of a state so maybe it's not just currency. Maybe could it be, you know, a promissory note issued by a bank could also be counterfeited that would be covered by this statute. Oh, I can see Bitcoin coming. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, there we go. Um, so, uh, Chair Grad, I wonder if I can just ask. I know that Robin Joy is on the call, and maybe she doesn't have the answer at the tip of her fingers. But, but when when she does testify, it would be nice if. Uh, I know that she has data that could tell us if this has been charged, uh, this particular offense in the last 10 years. And that would be kind of interesting to know. So she has yeah. that to answer now, but just to, if I could flag that for you, Robin, if you could take a look at that. Yes, sir. Thanks. All right, sorry All right. to so, delay you off. <laughs> sorry to have jumped back to that. Uh, Eric, I, I'm 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 good with that. Thanks. Oh sure, no problem. No, like I said, the the jump in anytime. Um, so the uh, we mentioned this. This is the credit card skimming devices, which has the, interesting has the same penalty. If you look at lines nine and ten here, page ten, you'll see the existing penalty is ten years, uh, and the proposed change is to change it to a class C felony, which is also a ten year maximum. And people probably know the credit card skimming device is a, essentially a device that um, can attach to, you know, when you put your credit card in the uh, uh, payment device at a store, they have other devices that, uh, illegal devices that can attach to that um, surreptitiously and obtain your credit card information. And that was a, uh, this statute was passed. This is, as you might guess, also a more recent statute, specifically about credit card skimming devices. 
I'm sure more recent than uttering a forgery, for example. Um, the uh, language then is more recent and uh, uh, addresses a very particular type of conduct um, that could also conceivably be charged as something else, whether it be uh, fraud or uh, some other type of offense. But there is something very particular about the credit card offense that um, made the 10-year felony um, be enacted uh, for this one. So um, I'm going to move on down here. Um, now, false personation and false pretenses or tokens are, all, are two, all two of the statutes that are quite old, have been on the books for some time. They have to do with falsely impersonating another person or uh, falsely obtaining mother money from another person. You see the first one, false personation. Uh, you personate, is, is think of it as impersonating, uh, impersonate another person or represent another person. And when you're doing that, you, you receive money that's intended to be delivered to that other person. Hello. So you, Hello. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. You pretend to be that other person and, and take money that was intended for them. Um, that currently you'll see is a 10 year felony. Uh, so if we switch over to the chart, false personation uh, follows the tears. So again, uh, it depends on how much money you have obtained uh, on when you're pretending to be that other person. Is it, uh, if it's less than $100, it's 30 days, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not the 10 year felony in all circumstances. Uh, it varies on the basis of um, uh, uh, the value of the money you obtained while you were engaged in the in the false impersonation. Same thing with uh, false pretenses, which is what we were just looking at, also follows the tiered proposal. Interesting, this is one of those offenses that does, under existing law, use that $900 threshold. See that it depends on if the amount of, we'll take a quick look back at the language here, um, if you, uh, uh, now a false token is also just seen you know, as a, fa a false document or a false symbol, uh, a false mark of some kind, could be a fake signature, for example, some kind of a uh, falsified document. If you, um, if you use a, a falsified document or, or uh, with the intent, I'm on line 12, to defraud and you obtain from another person money or other property, um, or release of a debt or obligation that's interesting, or the signature of a per person. So you obtain all these, uh, or any one of these uh, things from somebody else with the intent to defraud them by using a false token. Maybe you're, again, you use a, a, a false document that asserts that you're um, you know, somebody who you're not, or, or a false document that claims that you, know, you own property, but you don't. You use that to get somebody else to pay you money um, or to give you property uh, then it uh, results in this uh, penalty, uh, sorry, results in this crime, but again, uh, depends on the, um, the amount of property that you've obtained from the person as to what penalty would attach to that. So uh, we'll switch back to the chart and see that. So if it's, a, again, if it's a $900 or less, it's one year misdemeanor. If it's more than $900, it's a 10-year felony, which I remember is the same penalty that we saw for false impersonation, whereas the proposal in 887 is to follow the tiers. So again, will depend on how much property is involved, and it could be uh, as low as 30 days or as high as five years, depending. Home improvement fraud, another very recent crime. That's one that uh, um, has been adopted uh, in the 20th century, 21st, actually, it was 21st century, actually. Uh, and you'll see that the, um, I cut and pasted some of the language of what is home improvement fraud. It's what you would think it is. If you, if you, uh, you enter into a contract to, for home improvement, you don't perform. Uh, and then when the owner asks that you do perform, you either, you either refuse to do it or refuse to give them their money back. Or if you misrepresent material facts about the contract, that's number two, or the condition of the property or if you use unfair or deceptive acts or practices uh, to induce or encourage somebody to enter into the contract. Again, that's probably something that could be charged under one of the other existing offenses, but uh, as is often the case uh, with policy, it became viewed uh, 
by the legislature is such a, a, a widespread act that it needed to be addressed specifically. And so that's why you have the specific statute of more recent vintage having to do with home improvement fraud as a particular offense. And um, again, penalty and even under existing law um, depends on the amount of the value of property that's involved in the fraud. So you look at our chart again, if it's a less than a thousand under current law, it's a two year misdemeanor. Uh, if it's more than, a th or sorry, and these actually use multiple offenses as well. So if it's less than a thousand, you do it a second time, then it becomes a three year felony. But you see that. Um, if it's more than a thousand dollars, it starts as a three year felony, but if it's more than a thousand dollars, second time, it becomes a five year felony. In each of these instances, uh, the tiered proposal is followed. So in some instances, it's gonna be less, some instances, it's gonna be more, um, but you'll see that the maximum is actually the same in this case, because the maximum under current law uh, for the highest degree of home improvement fraud, more than $1,000 second offense, maximum is five years, the same way that's the five year maximum under the tiered system that's proposed in H87. So now we're getting into another recent uh, crime, which is the crime of identity theft. Also, whoops, sorry, um, enacted more recently. Um, let's see, there it is. And this to also cut and pasted some of the elements of the offense here. If you obtain, produce, possess, use personal identifying information belonging or pertaining to another person with the intent to use the information to commit a crime. So that's that you, you obtain this personally identifying info uh, with the intent to commit a crime, um, or if you uh, you transfer someone else's personal identifying information without their consent, um, facilitating the use of that information by somebody else to commit a crime. So it's not just that you you uh, obtain it from somebody, you get it from somebody and give it to somebody else, always with the intent to commit a crime is sort of the underlying requirement there. That's what the offense is. Um, so this this... Uh, is another offense that gets more severe the second time you do it. So you see, this is the very top of this page. Uh, the current penalty is that a three-year felony identity theft for $5,000. But if you do it the second time, it's a 10-year felony. And this is also one of the ones you see where uh, the proposal does not take the tiered approach. So it, uh, it, it uh, actually maintains the... Uh, at least in terms of the incarceration, the penalties that are in existing law. So for the first offense, existing law is three years, $5,000. The proposal in H87 is also three years. The, penalty, the fine is actually increased uh, from 5,000 to 15,000. Same with the second offense, the 10 year imprisonment is the same, but the fine goes up from 10,000 to 50,000. So now we've got insurance fraud. Again, you see that some of these, that you, we have gone through some of these events. You see some of them speak very generally, you know, falsely impersonating another, another person, uh, where some are particular to really uh, certain sets of facts, whether it be uh, insurance fraud or home improvement fraud, that sort of thing. So, and these are, uh, you'll see these, in the criminal statutes frequently and seem to be often responding to a particular uh, problem as it comes along. Sometimes a more particular statute um, will be enacted, which is what happened with uh, insurance fraud. I'm having a hard time pulling it up here. Here we go. So insurance fraud also, as you might expect, uh, is what it sounds like uh, would be, I'm on line 14 there. If, if you, in a fraudulent insurance act, is if you would the intent to defraud, you present a claim. You, uh, for a payment or benefit that contains false representations uh, as to a material fact or conceals a material fact, or um, you do the same thing concerning, this is line 20, concerning the solicitation for sale of any insurance policy. So if you're, you're trying to purchase it or you're trying to sell it, either way, um, it can be insurance fraud. Now, again, this is one of the offenses that varies based on the $900 threshold under current law. You see, so if it's less than $900, it's a six month misdemeanor. If it's more than 900, it's a five year felony. 
And the second offense is also a five-year felony, regardless of the amount. And the proposal, again, follows the tiers in each, each instance. So um, depending on the amount of money involved in the insurance fraud, the penalty could be less or it could be more, uh, depending, as I say, uh, on how much was defrauded. And now we get into the uh, larceny statutes. Uh, Eric, Eric, before yeah. you go any further, what, on the insurance fraud, um, they basically do the same thing. So why do we need, what, why is there like three of them? You mean in the left-hand column? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that part I guess is I'm just a little confused. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, I'm just saying I'm confused. Maybe I, I didn't quite understand what you said, maybe. But um, I, I guess I need a little more explanation on why there's three different types of insurance frauds. Do you mean, when you say three, are you referring to the left-hand column that we're looking at right now? Um, yes. Well, see, though, that's the same crime. It's just a different penalty depending on how much money was defrauded. Okay, then it goes to uh, uh, to the tiered column for just insurance fraud. Exactly. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So, Eric, I'm looking at our time at around three-ish or so. I want to take a break. So I'm not sure, um, just keep that in mind in terms of how much time you need, unless this is a good breaking point or where we could go for another five or so minutes. Um, I'm pretty flexible. You've now it seemed like a, we're moving from insurance to larceny. So it might be a good time to break. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Up All right, great. <laughs> so let's take about a, um, a 15 minute break, please. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> 